I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 is our text today. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're in the room here at Sweetwater, if you're at our Parker campus, then just there's a table right behind you. Just uh, go get up right now and go grab it and uh, grab one of those Bibles and turn to Matthew 5. And that's which is page 962. Page 962, you'll be able to follow along with us and follow the text. And as always, if you're in the room at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, uh, ask for one. We'll get you one. You can ask our online host. You can uh, email the church office, calvaryaz.com. We'll be glad to get you a, uh, a Bible one way or the other. We want everyone to have God's Word and read God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, Next Sunday afternoon, I really want to uh, echo this invitation to our Next Steps classes. Uh, we offer Next Steps classes because everyone needs to take a next step. And so at 6 p.m., when we have childcare provided, you can take an intro class. Guess what that's about? That's just about Calvary. It's the introduction to Calvary. Uh, we have a grow class, which is about growing in Christ. We have a serve class, which is about how we serve as a church in our community. And we'd love to invite anyone to any of those. And then at three in the afternoon, because I demand more time, I'm teaching the lead class, which is the uh, class which qualifies you to lead people. And, and really, if you're like a hardcore and you wanna know all about Calvary and you're like, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure, sign up for the lead class, take it, and then go to the intro class right after. It works, uh, you can do that. So uh, I'm just inviting, or come take lead, go to grow afterwards. Come take lead and go serve. But please sign up so we have the materials for you. That's next Sunday, February 5th. And by the way, there's no football on that day. <laughs> Done on purpose uh, that way. So anyway, hey, speaking of the intro class, uh, if you come to the intro class next Sunday evening at six o'clock, you will be introduced to our essential beliefs. And the very first one is uh, about the Bible. We believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. What to believe and how to live. That's, we believe that about the Bible. And, and that's why we give Bibles away. That's why we encourage you to read God's Word because we know that it's gonna tell you what to believe and how to live. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we go, yes, I get it. I understand it. It makes sense perfect sense to me. Like, for instance, you reap what you sow. Most of us kind of get that. We go, okay, if I, if I sow to the flesh, from the flesh, I'm going to reap destruction. Makes sense to me. I get that. I know what that means to sow to the flesh. I know what the evil deeds are. Uh, if I do the good things, if I do the right things, if I follow Jesus, I'm going to get life. I'm going to get eternal life. I'm going to get blessings. That makes sense. I can do that. I can apply that to my life. Got it. Sometimes we read the Bible and go, What? It's confusing. I mean, we don't understand it, and it leaves us wondering. Like Revelation chapters 6 through 18. Anybody been there with me? I mean, you're like, oh, I think I've got this all figured out. No, you don't. Just, just telling you you don't. I mean, we've got seals and trumpets and bowls. Oh, my. <laughs> we've got witnesses and dragons and beasts. Oh, my. <laughs> Uh, you know, and then you get to chapter 19, and you're like, all right, we win. It's good. So uh, sometimes we read the Bible and go, no, I don't like it. I get it, but I don't like what it says. Today's passage might be one of those. As we're continuing to look at the Beatitudes that Jesus taught in, uh, and looking at how Jesus explains the good life, we come to Matthew 5, 5, which says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. This is the third beatitude. You guys have already memorized the first two, right? Right? The first one is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the second one is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We talked about that last week. And now we're looking at, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, can I just tell you, as a young man, I never aspired to meekness. It was not in the top 10 words that guys want to be known as, right, men? Anyone? I mean, because we, you know, 
We want to be known as strong, intelligent, successful, talented, leader, independent, reliable, creative, brilliant, handsome, rich. You know, those are the words that you know, guys look at. Meek doesn't crack the top 10. So just naturally, uh, most guys read that and go, not a big fan of blessed are the meek. Even though Jesus says meekness is the path to the good life. So we're kind of in this place where we know Jesus says blessed are the meek, and in our souls, half the room, half those joining us online, are kind of like, I don't really like that. What does he mean? Now, see, the problem is us. More specifically, the problem is our definition of meek. Because in English, the word meek rhymes with weak. Weak. I don't know what you guys were thinking, but it rhymes with weak. And as a man, I don't want to be weak. I mean, I had three brothers. Two of them were older, and I never wanted to show weakness. I never wanted to show fear, never wanted to be seen as a coward, never wanted to be called sissy. Right? I mean, you just, yeah, that, those are... Those are words you don't want to hear. So can I just tell you, I never aspired to be meek and mild. Nope, didn't didn't want to be known as that. But uh, in the words uh, uh, of Inigo Montoya and the Princess Bride, (laughs) I do not think that word means what you think it means. See, that's our problem. The problem is our definition. The problem is what we think of when the word meek is used because meekness is not weakness. Look at the person next to you and just tell them meekness is not weakness. Hopefully they told it to you back because I want you guys to get this. See, meekness is allowing God to control your strength. Meekness is allowing God to, be, to control your strength. In other words, to be meek means that you have strength and it is under control. It, it, to be meek means that you have to be strong. If you have no strength, you can't be meek because you have no strength to put under control. So originally, the idea of meek was an ox pulling a plow, which is where we get the phrase, weak as an ox from, right? Right? Now, you think about this, it doesn't make any sense. If the, if the picture of meekness is an ox pulling a plow, then um, it's not weak as an ox, it's strong. strong as an ox. And yet an ox is a picture of meekness. Hmm. Think about that. See how our definitions kind of mess things up? Or maybe just our language and the, what rhymes with what. Another picture of meekness is uh, this one. Take, check out, I think that's Hoover Dam. We got Hoover Dam up there? No, we don't. So we'll put it up there in a second. Rivers are powerful, and yet when they are harnessed for energy, when they're harnessed for water, then they are a picture of meekness because that strength of that river is now used for good, to light a city, to uh, uh, provide recreation, drinking water, all that kind of stuff. Or how about this? When you take light and you focus light so intensely that it can cut steel, it's a picture of meekness. Now, I'm not gonna stand in front of that laser. I don't think you want to either, because it'd cut us in half. But that's meekness. Or how about this? Here's a picture of meekness. Yeah, we saw that a minute ago, right, with Derek and Ava. But does that, does that guy look weak to you? No, he doesn't. But the truth is, uh, any father holding a baby has the power to crush or the power to protect and nurture. See, see, that's meekness. When you use that power that he has to provide protection and nurture, then you're being meek, not weak. So if we truly want to experience the good life, we need to understand and embrace meekness, which means we've got to get the definition correct. So is meekness weakness? No, it's not. And and we got to remember that. Meekness is allowing God to control your strength. Now, once we understand that, then we have to figure out what does that look like in life? So let's talk about the application of meekness. I want to take a little bit 
and, and just kind of go, what does a meek life look like? If you're going to live a meek life, if you're going to get to the good life that Jesus is talking about, then what does that actually look like for us? In, in other words, in our lives, how do we live in, in order to say, hey, this is a life that is meek, so we're blessed, so that, uh, you know, we inherit the earth, so we get the promises. Well, first of all, if we're going to live a meek life, we have to recognize our power. You need to recognize your power. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, tell us that we all, male and female, were made in the image of God. You were made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. By the way, that's why every single life has value, born and unborn. Every single life has value. Every single person has value because we are created in the image of God, but God has also given us power because we are created in his image. Power to rule, power to produce, power to protect, power to build. All of it is God given. Now, the enemy, Satan, wants you to actually believe that you are weak. He wants you to believe that you are incapable, that you are insignificant, that you are powerless, and he wants you to believe that you're a victim. And you can't do anything to change. You're, you're, you're stuck. And if you buy into Satan's narrative, then you miss out on the good life. Let me just say that again. If you go ahead and decide you're going to own life as a victim, that you can do nothing to change anything, then, then you're going to miss out on the good life because you're buying into Satan's narrative. That's what he wants you to believe. Now, I'm not saying you can do this on your own, but I am saying with the Christ's power, that's why we take our power and give it to God, and God can change our life through that. But if you buy into Satan's narrative, you're missing out on the good life. But to live a meek life is to recognize you have power and use your power for God's purpose. Okay, so first of all, you recognize, okay, I have been gifted power by God because I'm created in his image, I'm made. Uh, but now it's about taking that power that he's given you that every single person possesses and using it for God's purpose. Using it for God's kingdom. Strength under God's control for God's kingdom, that's what meekness looks like. Let me say that again. Meekness looks like strength under God's control for God's kingdom kingdom. So use your abilities for God's purpose. Use your abilities for God's purpose. You know that God created you with talents and you've developed abilities and you've gained experience and you've been given spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit. Now all of that is true and God desires us to use the abilities, the experience, the talents, the gifts that he's given us to build his kingdom, to strengthen his church and to bless people in his name. By the way, that's why radical service is one of the core values of Calvary, because we believe that we best demonstrate the love of Jesus through acts of kindness and service. When we take the, the abilities, the talent, the gifts that God has given us, and we use them to share the love of Christ with people who don't know him. That, that's what it means that to use your power for God's purpose, use your abilities. And so we wanna help you live the good life by taking your talents and turning them loose to bless people in Jesus' name, plain and simple. So are you using your talents and your abilities and your experience to contribute to the kingdom of God? So you have to, you have to figure that out. You have to wrestle with that. Because Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Are you then taking your strength and your abilities and applying them for the kingdom? There's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do that in the church building, helping out, uh, you know, here, serving. I know we, we've got a tech ministry that can always use volunteers. We've got uh, a kids ministry. You know, I love the fact that Calvary's got children all over the place. And we provide childcare four uh, days and evenings a week for the ministries that we have. And we do part of that with paid workers, but we do part of that with volunteers. And so if you're somebody who loves kids and you can pass a background check and you're committed to doing ministry our way, then we'd love to have you volunteer. Just grab one of those connect cards and fill it out and say, hey, I wanna do that. You actually can do this for any of these ministries, for tech, for kids. 
for the prayer ministry, for safety ministry, for first impressions, for worship ministry, if you have talent, okay? So it's one of those requirements. But if God, you know, there's some of you that God's actually, ta- you have talent and, and you're kind of keeping it to yourself. Or using your talents and abilities to contribute to the kingdom of God can mean serving in the community to represent Christ and Calvary. So how many of you volunteered for the balloon festival last weekend? The weather was better today, wasn't it? See, there's some of you that volunteered and you were there. Now, I hope you weren't just there because you wanted to get in for free. But um, it's not a bad gig if you get it. But I mean, hopefully you were there not only to serve, but also to represent to be there to say, hey, I represent Christ. I represent Calvary. I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to be shoulder to shoulder and nose to nose with people who are far from God so that I can influence them for the kingdom of God. So uh, volunteering strategically and intentionally is a wonderful thing. So use your abilities for God's purpose and use your words for God's purpose. Do you you realize your words are powerful? Every one of you in here, your words are powerful powerful. The Bible talks a lot about our words and the tongue. Proverbs 12 says, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. It's power to cut and hurt, power to heal. James chapter 3, James says, uh, with our words we praise God, and with them we curse men who are made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursings. That shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Then, of course, Ephesians chapter 4, the apostle Paul said, let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth, but only that which is building others up that it may benefit those who hear. See, every time you open your mouth, you have the power to bless or to curse, to build up or tear down, to help or to hurt. Every single time. Parents, Please use the power of your words to bless your, kill, your children. Just, just do it. You know, yes, you have to discipline, but teach them the truth. Encourage them to follow Jesus and bless them with your words. Spouses, hey, if you're married and you're in this room, if you want a healthier marriage, wait, do you guys want a healthier marriage? Use your words to bless and encourage your spouse. Okay, just, just do it. Heal them, help them, encourage them. Look, all of us know the damage that is done by careless words, and we especially know the damage done by intentionally spoken destructive words. Again, every time you open your mouth, it's either gonna build your marriage up or it's gonna tear it down. Decide to use your powerful words for God's purpose. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, do your words represent the grace of Jesus or the destruction of Satan? I mean, look, you've got a conversation, and either people are going to see Jesus in that or they're going to recognize Satan in that. Words are powerful. A meek life uses their words for God's purpose and a meek life, use your resources for God's purpose. Your resources for God's purpose. Most of us in this room have economic power. God gave you resources. How are you using them? I mean, you have the power to make a a difference. We have the power to take care of ourselves, but we also have the power to bless people and build God's kingdom, which by the way, as we looked at last week very briefly, will bless us because Jesus said give and it will be given to you for the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So it's wise to give. So again, a question, will you use your resources for the kingdom? Will you allow God to control the strength of your finances? I mean, I hope that's a question you wrestle with all week long because being meek means that you submit your resources to God and allow him to use them. Which, by the way, it means a life of generosity. A life of generosity. Now, here's the thing. Sociologists tell us that pretty much everyone 
considers themselves to be generous. Nobody you meet ever goes, hey, you know what? I am cheap, cheap, cheap. I'm the stingiest person alive. I'm not going to share anything with anybody. No, most people think that they're generous. Oh, I'm a generous person. Yes, I'm generous. I, you know, I do this. I give here. I do that. And, and the thing is, it's not whether we think we're generous or not. It's whether God thinks we're generous or not. And he's given us these resources. And, and you know, we've talked about this a lot. We've got more than, you know, the average one of us has more than about 85% of the people in the world. We have economic power. The question is, are we using it for the kingdom of God? And, and by the way, for the record, God asks his people to demonstrate their generosity by giving him 10% of their income. It's called a tithe. And, and the average Christian in America gives 2.5% of their income to charity. Two and a half percent versus 10 percent. We consider ourselves generous, and, and I don't think Jesus does. So God asks his people to demonstrate their submission to him by tithing. And if we did that, well, we'd be unleashing our power for God's purpose. By the way, I'm mentioning that, and uh, we're under construction at our Parker Remodel down in Parker, so uh, that's exciting. For those in the Parker campus, you guys ought to be celebrating right now too. But uh, I'm just telling you that we're on, on the way, but we need about $400,000 to finish that. We've got about 60%, we need about 40% more. And, and, and so if God's blessed you and you wanna contribute to that, we'd love to have you help us do that. But you know what? Even in the, in the kingdom's work, that's above and beyond the 10% that God expects all of us to give him anyway. So will you use your economic power for God's purpose? Your abilities, your words, your resources, and will you use your influence for God's purpose? See, all of us have influence, and that influence is power. You have influence with your family. You have influence with your kids, your friends. All of those relationships equal influence. You have influence with your opinions, right? We all know that because we, we look at Rotten Tomatoes to see what people think about movies. We read, you know, reviews on restaurants on Yelp, right? Oh, this place is no good. Look at all these people, what they said. That's you guys. We have influence. We use that. We spread our opinions around thinking, oh, you guys have opinions when you try to figure out where to eat after church, right? You're having this, oh, I don't like to go in that place. Their, their food's terrible, and I think their food's good. What, you know, and, and what do you do about that? See, here's the thing, though. Some of us, would rather use our influence for a restaurant or a movie than for Jesus. And God invites us to use the power of our influence to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So again, parents, make your children's spiritual life a priority, please. If you don't, they won't. Friends, I say friends, people. If you have friends, Use your influence to invite them to church. They won't come to church. Invite them to life group. They won't come to life group. And then invite them to one of our projects that we're doing in the community. Serve our schools as March the 4th. Sign up, drag one of your neighbors who's really handy but doesn't want to come to church and let him hang out with Christians who are serving the community. See if it doesn't influence them to maybe change their perspective on things. But talk about life and faith in a positive way and see how God uses your influence to change lives. So meekness means we recognize and use our power for God's purpose. And we want to do this because meekness leads to success. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness leads to success in life, in marriage, with family, in careers, in real time, in this world. So think about the options for your power. Let's go back to this thing. You're powerful. God made you in his image. He gave us all talents, abilities. We talked about all this stuff. So we have power. So think about the options for your power. So strength without focus is wasted. Strength without focus is wasted. You ever seen a, a horse running wild? I always hear people talk about, oh, it's so beautiful to watch the horses run wild. Right? Oh, it's so lovely. Watch, look at that. They're just wild, those beautiful creatures. You know, the thing is, a horse running wild may be beautiful, but it doesn't produce much except for manure. 
right? An aimless life is one that is wasted. We've all known people that had talents and abilities and brains and never used them, right? And all they produce is disappointment and manure. That's it. So strength without focus is wasted and strength out of control is destructive. It's destructive. And we talked about a river and how a dam harnesses that power and, and makes it productive. But when a river floods and it overflows its banks and it goes out, then it's destructive and it destroys all the things around it in its path. Same is true with us. An abusive spouse or parent is destructive. Some of you are still dealing with the trauma of that from years ago. An addict willing to lie and cheat and deceive is destructive. You know, it's so easy to condemn destructive behavior in other people and not see it in ourselves, isn't it? I don't have a drinking problem. I just like the taste. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I can drive. It's fine. I'm just a little bit buzzed. I'm good. Right? We make all these excuses. I'm not out of control. I just have a short fuse. I'm not out of control. I'm just Irish, Italian, Mexican, German. You fill in the nationality. See, strength out of control is destructive, always. I, I, and if, if you're not convinced of this, read Proverbs. Proverbs says over and over and over again, basically, don't hang out with angry people because they're going to wreck their life and yours. I mean, I mean, that's the wisdom of Solomon to his boys. Hey, if your friends are all angry at the world, don't hang out with them. They're just going to get you in trouble. Strength out of control is destructive, which is why we have Celebrate Recovery. Monday night, 6.30, right here in this room. And uh, by the way, it may be your first step towards meekness. So if you need to be here, be here. So, you know, strength that, that uh, is, you know, wasted or that has aimless is wasted. Strength out of control is destructive. Strength under control builds and blesses. That's meekness. It can pull a wagon, it can move a car, it can light a city, it can provide power for air conditioning, all things that we love. And each one of us has the power to bless our family and serve our community and build God's kingdom and influence for Jesus. The choice is, will I choose to be meek? I don't care if you like the word. Understand the concept and live it out. You don't have to go around telling people your goal is to be meek. Just use your strength under control for God's kingdom and let him do the rest. So will you choose to be meek? Will you allow God to control your strength? Will you believe Jesus when he says, this is the way to the good life? Because blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. I don't like meek because it rhymes with weak and that's got a bad rap in our language. But you know what? I believe Jesus and I do aspire to be meek. Let's pray. Father, you had all power and all authority and yet you allowed your one and only son who had all power and all authority to lay all of it aside and demonstrate meekness for us because he took the form of a, of a human, a baby, and grew into a man who lived a sinless life and then gave himself as a sacrifice for us willingly on the cross to demonstrate what that strength under control looks like. Even when he was mocked, he refused to respond except to pray, Father, forgive them. Lord, we know we fall short. You know we're aimless. You know we waste our strength. You know we use it destructively. And we just want to repent. And we want to surrender. And we want you to teach us how to live meek lives. So God, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would move in this room. And that we would listen. We'd listen to the rebuke. We'd listen to the, the challenge. And we would take our strength and we would lay it at your feet. And we would live different lives because we believe, Jesus, that blessed are the meek. 
This is our prayer. We ask it in his name. Amen.